morning, everybody. Our first speaker today is Peter Hudson, Director of Hux Institute of Life Sciences and William Professor in Biology. Dr. Hudson leads a career focused on ecology of wildlife, diseases, including zoonosis. His group uses a mixture of field work, laboratory studies, and mathematical modeling to explore disease dynamics. In three main study areas, epidemiology, population dynamics, heterogeneities, and parasite interactions. He frequently travels, and he's recently back from Ghana last night. We are so very glad that he is with us today. Please welcome everybody, Dr. Peter Hudson. If you look in the book of Revelations, it tells us that God sits there, and in his right hand sits a scroll. That scroll attached to it are seven different seals. The seals are then broken by the Lion of Judah. And when those seals are broken, out come four horse riders. A horse rider on a white horse, one on a black, one red horse, another on a black and a pale horse. And these are meant to be the riders of the apocalypse. And they're meant to represent conquest, war, famine, and disease. That's the Christian belief. And the Christian belief is that these are the harbingers of doom. These are the harbingers that are going to destroy civilization just prior to the day of judgment. If I were rewriting that today, I would have a very different set of uh, harbingers. Yes, I would still include disease, but I would also be worried about habitat loss, biodiversity loss, and climate change. So what I think is that these are the real problems we're facing in the world, all of them coupled with overpopulation. And none of these are independent. Each one interacts with another one. And people are influencing habitat. Habitat is influencing disease, habitat loss, and so climate. They're all interrelated. And my thesis for the day is that we need to train people. We need to train the next generation in being able to do interdisciplinary work here. It's no good having a medic who doesn't understand climate. And it's no good having a meteorologist who doesn't understand disease biology. Now, I just literally got off the plane. I've just come back from Ghana. I've been working with the World Health Organization. And at this meeting, we were discussing the vulnerable people of Africa and concerns about climate adaptation. How are the vulnerable people in this world going to adapt to climate adaptation? How are they, in particular, in relation to disease and issues of disease? I'm particularly interested in the Maasai, and the Maasai live here in northern Tanzania on the Maasai Steppe. And I'm worried about these people because these people are wrapped up in their lives with nothing but their cattle. That is everything to these people. And yet climate change is giving us drought. They're losing their habitat. They're suffering from disease. And what are we going to be able to do about it? And how can we help work with these people to get things right? I'm going to start by stressing the whole issue of climate. I'm particularly and I think it's important to realize that climate change is something that really does exist. If you look at the IPCC report about climate change, it is very clear. Climate change is taking place. Temperatures are increasing. Every national academy in the world, and to my mind, those are the cleverest scientists we have, agrees that climate change is taking place, but not all our politicians do. What it was also telling us is this is going to continue to take place. And in places in Africa, the temperature is going to increase. But moreover, and this is a thing I'm going to come back to later, we're going to see increased variation in many of those climatic events. So we're going to see more extreme events. Extreme events exactly like Hurricane Sandy. Now, we can withstand that. Yes, there were a lot of people that died during it, but we can withstand it. But what about the vulnerable people of Africa? Less than a month ago, I was in Tanzania with the Maasai, very close to, the, to Kilimanjaro. Mount Kilimanjaro, this remarkable mountain that comes out of the Maasai steppe. 
It's remarkable because it's usually covered in ice and snow. And it's very clear that we're losing that ice and snow. It's very clear that climate change is resulting in the loss of the traditional glaciers. But what else is taking place? What else is taking place is the habitat is changing. The average temperatures are going up in the mountain, and it's going up across the Maasai Steppe. And so with it comes a number of diseases. And one of the diseases I'm interested in is trypanosomiasis, a disease that causes sleeping sickness. Now, I'm a disease biologist, and I always think it's great to study the diseases you've had. And in 1975, while I was visiting what was then Zaire in Western Africa, I went down with sleeping sickness. So it's been one of my lifelong ambitions to study every disease that I've got. And I have yet to study sleeping sickness, so I've now set up a project to start looking at sleeping sickness. Now, sleeping sickness is actually limited in its extent by the environmental conditions. As the temperature warms, so these animals, so these insects that give you the sleeping sickness are going higher up the mountain and they're causing more and more problems for the people, uh, not just on Mount Kilimanjaro, but right across the Maasai Steppe. Now, I mentioned before, and I think this is very important, it's very important to realise how that uh, climate change is not just a change in temperature, but a change in the variability in that temperature and the precipitation. Now, you may think, well, what's that got to do biologically? Well, when we start to look to see what's happening in Africa, and this zone, this zone marked by the black dots, is where malaria exists. And the colours tell you the average temperature and the extent of the variation. And daily temperature changes in Africa are as, oh, as, are as much as 14 degrees centigrade. Now, I realised this was an American audience, so I had to put in that that's 25 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that's an enormous change in temperature from one day to the next. Some of my colleagues working here in Penn State have just shown, and when I say just shown, like last week, they showed me the figures, to show me that the malaria vector that causes that, the mosquito, when you have cold temperatures and you have variation, they develop faster. That is amazing. That means that these particularly cold temperatures at the edge of the extreme, we can expect malaria to move at a faster rate across Africa. So we really have some very important disease issues taking place. And these are just two of the many diseases that I could have referred to. But when I talk about Africa, you can't help thinking about many of the other emerging diseases, many of the diseases that have appeared and come out of Africa. At the moment, the world, or in Africa, there's more than 30 million people infected with HIV. Many of those people living in southern Africa and parts of eastern Africa. Where did HIV come from? It actually came from ch chimpanzees. Well, there's two forms of HIV. HIV-1 and HIV-2. HIV-1 is the type that we have in the Western world and across most of Africa. And that really came from chimpanzees. It originated in chimpanzees, and then it uh, emerged in parts of Western Africa, uh, in and around Cameroons and the DRC. And it probably came because people were chopping up chimpanzees and basically eating them. And we know there have been at least three, probably many more, spillover events when SIV got into humans and evolved into a form of HIV. Similarly, with HIV-2, that came up from the Ghana, Sierra Leone area, and it came from the Sutil Manganese, and that's spilt over. We've seen multiple events of that taking place. So it's come from these animals, and this has really come because people have been exposed more to these diseases. And this is part of the habitat destruction. We're destroying the habitat, we're getting into the bush, people are killing the animals that live in there, and so they're becoming infected with these viruses. Ebola, another infection that's a big concern. It causes, a case, has a case fatality rate of 90%. That means if you get infected with Ebola, you're more or less guaranteed to die from it. Flu, the case fatality rate is something like 2 or 3%, and that's only in the very significant forms of flu. Most diseases are, are not, the case fatality rate is, is very small. 
The, case, the mortality is so high that when people get infected, it spreads through a village and then it disappears because it burns out through the population so fast. It kills everybody in that village and it never has time for an infectious person to walk to the next village. We don't even know where it's coming from. We have no idea what the reservoir host is. We've just discovered groups of gorillas, of lowland gorillas, also suffering from it. And there are vast areas of the forest of Western Africa where these diseases have wiped out the lowland gorillas. We still don't know where it's coming from. But it is a concern. It is something we need to think about. Of course, you're not going to get an infection. And you're certainly not going to get Ebola unless you come into contact with somebody who actually has Ebola. So contact meets are extremely important. How, if you live by yourself in the middle of nowhere, you will never suffer from an infection because you will never be exposed. But if you come into contact with people and the burgeoning population of Africa is going to give us more and more problems with some of these emerging diseases. Now, one of the challenges is how do we actually measure this? What can we actually do to understand what the contact rates are? And a colleague of mine here at Penn State has done this beautiful piece of work using night lights in Africa. So in the Sahel district, that's the area below the Sahara, she's been recording the movement of people by looking at night lights, by looking at the fires that people light. And by using satellite imagery, she can see where the groups of people are. And as we move towards more drought conditions, so people tend to aggregate around the water areas. When they, when they go and aggregate around these water areas, so they become infected. And she's been following diseases such as measles. Now, you don't think of measles as being an important disease. It is still one of the six big killers in the world at the moment. And in countries like Niger, where she's been doing the studies, it's of immense importance. One of the big problems has been trying to predict when a measles outbreak could take place. So what she's been doing is following this movement of these people, using these night lights, recording when they're going to come together, when contact rates, and when we can expect a disease outbreak to occur. At that point, she can, say, she can then tell Médecins Sans Frontières, OK, it looks as though you're going to get an outbreak. And they can fly in there with the deep freezes, with the vaccines, and start vaccinating the children. The issue is that there's no support in that country. You can't guarantee electricity. I mean, people ask me why I didn't email back from Ghana yesterday. Well, I can tell you the electricity is out three out of four hours. And then you try and get somebody to give you an internet connection in the 20 minutes you've got access. It's really difficult. So, this is, the, this is an interesting and a novel type of approach. At the end of the day, what we really need to do is to work closely with vulnerable people. And there's no group, as far as I'm concerned, that are more delightful and charming to work with than the Maasai. They're very proud people, very proud people. They're people that uh, have concerns, they have traditions. You want to work with them with those traditions to understand how you can adapt them to climate change. I believe one way of doing this is to take an interdisciplinary approach. And I think here at this university, we should be training our next generation of people to understand these multiple disciplines, to have a comprehension about meteorology, medicine, biology. So the next generation can go forth and work in teams to start addressing these issues. But this goes further than this, because I'm very keen that we also develop capacity in Africa. It's important that we have African students develop and be able to look after these problems in their own country. And that's where the future is. We want to take students from this university, pair them up with the students in Africa, so they can work together to try and uh, tackle these problems that the people in Africa are currently facing. Thank you very much indeed.